Oh, smash that dislike button. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Business Blaze. It is your boy with the Blaze, Simon. As always on this channel, Danny has put us together a script. This one is a heavily requested one, DeLorean Motor Vehicles. I'd vaguely been familiar with this. I mean, obviously everyone's familiar with the car because of Back to the Future and the doors go like this. I really would like one of these cars. But also, apparently there's this whole super interesting story. I believe there's something to do with cocaine at some point, which is always fun on the blaze. God, I love cocaine. So uh, let's just jump in. Um, and of course, credit to Sam as well, resident memeologist who adds all of the memes. Let's do it. For some reason, this light feels a lot brighter today. I don't know why, like maybe I've got these studio lights here. This one, this one feels really bright, like my eyes hurt. I don't, I don't like it. I have to admit, if it wasn't for the Banks of the Future films, I probably wouldn't know what a DeLorean even looked like. Neither would anyone else, Danny. Because <laughs> it's not like, oh yeah, yeah, DeLorean. You know? Of course, Ford, Mercedes, DeLorean. But I always kind of assumed that this was just because I've never known anything remotely useful about cars, and that most normal viewers of the films, the kind of people that take some sort of interesting things going on around them, would already have been very familiar with the distinctive sight of a DMC DeLorean sports car when the films first hit the cinema screens. Well, it's a DeLorean, right? Stay with what me, Marty. All your questions will be answered. Roll yeah. tape. Okay, I will proceed. All, I, I, re I recently re-watched these movies, by the way. I've seen all of them, two, three, one, uh, 213 is the correct order, which everyone disagrees with, but you're wrong. And all I remember is like, wow, you know, the car's got to get to 88 miles an hour to go back in time. And it's like, it's a really long sequence getting up to 88, and I'm like, wow, that's slow, right? It's like, 20, 75 years later, 30. It turns out that this is not entirely true. I had no idea that outside of the United States, at least, the DeLorean was a relatively obscure, damp squib of a vehicle which had already been largely forgotten before the Back to the Future films came along and turned it into an iconic symbol of cinematic time travel. However, the real story behind the disastrous production of the DMC DeLorean car could easily have made a film in itself. In fact, it eventually did, kind of as two separate films popped up in 2019, although one of them was a weird hybrid of a documentary and drama, while the other was criticized for being wildly inaccurate. Neither of them performed very well at the box office. I do find those, you know, documentary dramas where it's like, yeah, it's a documentary, but then they have actors playing out some of the scenes. I'm like, and it's never particularly well acted. I'm always like, it's a bit shit, isn't it? <laughs> this format is not working. Which is what, you know, people say about business plays. They're like, Simon, what the f is this? You, 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 you don't have a teleprompter? It's that like, I'm actually looking at the camera through a teleprompter right now. It's off. This is a choice, boys. B-O-I. <laughs> yeah, boy. But while a true story of American engineer and inventor John DeLorean may not feature quite as many hoverboards or slightly disturbing incestuous plot twists as the Back to the Future trilogy, it does feature a bold and ambitious dream which was trampled over to some degree by Margaret Thatcher. A massive suitcase of cocaine. I knew there was cocaine. Always exciting. Wish I could jump in there and roll around and all that cascading white powder. And about $17 million, which got carelessly mislaid somewhere along the line. Me metaphorically speaking, it's the story of a talented engineer and businessman who drove his own dream vehicle at breakneck speed straight into a brick wall that was plastered with sticks of dynamite. Oh, shit. Yet somehow scrambled out of the fancy gullwing doors with nothing more than a few cuts and scratches and maybe a slightly lighter wallet. Spoiler alert, normally these end with someone going to prison. I guess not today. I guess we might be using the Business Blaze favorite, allegedly, which everyone is requesting gets made into a t-shirt, which is currently a work in progress. Merch has been a little bit slow because of the whole coronavirus thing. <laughs> coronavirus! Coronavirus! And I'm still waiting on a shipment of merch. It's actually available to buy right now, but I didn't really want to plug it until I tried it myself. So it's on its way. Allegedly. Uh, John Zachary DeLorean was born in 1925 in Detroit and raised by immigrant parents in a pretty tough neighborhood on the east side. His dad was probably part of the reason that the neighborhood was a bit rough as he had a bit of a reputation for drunk and brawling in the streets. Oh sh Dad. John's father had a job at the Ford Motor Company, so the, of course he lived in Detroit. Where else would he work? Uh, so the automobile industry clearly ran through the family blood, but the father's poor English skills and alcohol problems meant that he never progressed further than the factory floor. John's parents would later divorce, and he would have very little future contact with his dad, who ended up 
living the life of a solitary drug addict. Danny somehow makes that sound romantic, like he ended up living the life of a solitary drug addict. John DeLorean's own education was interrupted by the Second World War. Oh, he's really old. I didn't realize. I guess that would make sense. And he served three years in the US Army before receiving an honorable discharge and resuming his studies at the Lawrence Institute of Technology in, Detro in Detroit. He later picked up a master's degree in mechanical engineering and business administration uh, before entering the automotive industry in 1925 with a job at Packard Motor Company. Never heard of it. Maybe it became something else, got bought by someone, or maybe it just made cars. Maybe it was John's fault. John moved over to General Motors in 1956 and quickly made a name for himself, working as the lead engineer on such iconic cars as the Pontiac GTO and the Pontiac Firebird. I have no idea what any of these cars are because they're American. He rose through the ranks to eventually become GM's youngest ever head of division by the age of 40. Credited with the invention of overhead cam engines, concealed windshield wipers, the lane change turn signal, vertically stacked headlights, and approximately two other patented inventions that mean absolutely f all to me. Well, Danny, I mean, think about it. Concealed windshield wipers, so windshield wipers that are not obvious on the windscreen. No idea what an overhead cam engine. You and I together on that one, Danny. If anyone wants to enlighten us in the comments. The lane change turn signal. Isn't that just a... Oh, so the one that goes off automatically? No. Vertically stacked headlights, so, you know, one on top of each other rather than just in a line. That's pretty incredible, um, I gotta say. Uh, John DeLorean was developing into something of a business executive version of a rock star. He was... <laughs> so it's like successful and boring. <laughs> he was considered to have dashing good looks. He was down with the kids. He was uber confident. And he was generating acclaim for introducing sports car sexiness to the previously stiff and stuffy automotive industry, except for all of the sports cars. In his own words, he often saw the older executives around him as just sitting behind a desk wearing a pair of those old high top leather shoes and packing a big wad of cigars into their shirt pockets. It's very 1950s, isn't it? John DeLorean saw his role as shaking up an industry with rock and roll. Weirdly, he claimed that his strategic formula to gauge the developing trends of younger consumers was to listen to rock and roll music on the stereo. Oh my lord, what a cutting edge mofo. It's difficult to see exactly how John could have drawn up comprehensive business proposals based on the lyrics of Bill Haley and his comments, but something was clearly working for him. Never heard of Bill Haley and his comments. Probably because this is set in the 1950s and I've not heard of anything before 1996. As he was becoming a minus except for Back to the Future. And he was becoming a minor celebrity in his own right. He dated film stars and showgirls and regularly popped up on the social pages of the press. It also appeared as if he may have been just a little bit in love with himself. Well, he does sound pretty f***ing awesome. Uh, one of his many glamorous girlfriends revealed that she was disappointed with her Christmas gift from John. It was a lavish, leather-bound portfolio heaving with lots of lovely photographs of himself. <laughs> no. <laughs> really? Uh, no photographs of them together as a couple. Just him. So he got a book made with photographs of himself in it. That is, uh, like, narcissism to the max. It reminds me of the special birthday gift that Simon Whistler sent me this last year. It was the Simon Whistler shrugging sticker for me to slap on the radiator. Currently available for just $4.99. The sticker, not the radiator. Um, I do know we sell some stickers. Is, it, is there really a sticker of me shrugging? I think there might be one like this. Um, you're welcome, Danny, by the way. That $4.99 is quite expensive for a sticker. I don't set the prices on these things. I feel like the t-shirt's pretty good at like 20 something bucks. Like, get the t-shirt, even though that's more, so I get more money. But who, don't buy, I don't know, maybe you're rich. $4.99 seems expensive for a sticker to me. Stop, thief, stop right there, criminal scum. The merch company, I hope they don't watch this. Or maybe they do and we'll lower the prices. Uh, it seems that John DeLorean was destined to end up with a top, top job as CEO of General Motors. So it came as something of a surprise when he suddenly resigned in 1973 to form his own company instead. Well, no, it'd be surprising if he resigned to go and chill out on the beach. It wouldn't be surprising if he left to go and start his own company because he thinks... I can do better, because he's a narcissistic prick. Maybe. Look, I'm just judging him on the fact that he made his girlfriend a leather-bound book with photos of himself in it. It makes him sound like a bit of a nobbo. He had long expressed frustration at GM executives who seemed determined to wreck his plans for sales growth at every three-point turn. But a bum bum Okay. And he believed that GM were actively trying to keep sales down a bit because if they ever exceeded 50% of all car sales in the US, the government might be inclined to dismantle the company. That's pretty f 
tough, isn't it? It's like, yeah, you're too successful. Careful, guys, don't get too successful. Although it does seem like that's, you know, the law is broken, I guess. Nobody breaks the law on my watch. So, but it does seem like a sensitive, stra uh, a sensible strategy. A big turning point was when he delivered a private speech to 700 top GM executives in a hotel in West Virginia. It wasn't very private there, was it? Yeah, it's a private speech to 700 people. Uh, he criticized the current state of the company and the quality of the cars that they were producing. Uh, he'd actually, if you haven't seen the video we did about Ratner, and when he described his jewelry as not lasting longer than a prawn sandwich, uh, or a shrimp sandwich as you Americans might say, definitely check that out, because that guy f***ed up too. And it's always fun, on the blaze, when it's a f*** up, isn't it? Because it's like, yeah, when it's like, oh, it was really success- whenever I pitch this channel, it's like, business blaze, we look at great successes and failures, and I'm like, yeah, but we really look at failures, don't we? Although I did just record a video about how McDonald's is awesome. Anyway, he actually toned down the script quite a bit before he delivered it, just like we do at Business Plays when we're making a video about Donald Trump. Oh, smash that dislike button. But when the original uncut version of his script was leaked, again, not super private, is it? His detractors and even his former supporters at GM turned on him. It was time to order a taxi home. But a bum bum. But free from the shackles of the stifling oldies at GM. John DeLorean could now pursue his new dream, cocaine. When is the cocaine coming into this story? I'm already excited. God, I miss cocaine. He wanted to build a new ethical safety sports car, a fuel-efficient car that had minimal environmental impact and the very best safety features, while both being distinctively stylish and very affordable. John, it sounds like you don't know what a sports car is. Like, yeah, yeah, it's incredibly uh, efficient. It does not to 60 in 17 seconds and 60 miles to the gallon. It's like, John, you've built a Prius. In a nutshell, he wanted the car to be the absolute best of everything, while Steve but still being quite cheap to buy. That's a tough commission. Yeah, it sounds pretty impossible. Uh, the, jo the DeLorean Motor Company, or DCM, no, Danny, DMC. I'm not misreading that. Come on, Danny! DeLorean Company Motor. That doesn't sound right, does it, Danny? DeLorean Motor Company, DMC, was founded in 1975 and quickly got to work on designing the new vehicle, which originally went under the name DMC-12. So-called because the idea was to sell the luxurious car for just $12,000, which is, I don't know how many dollars in today's money, but more. 1975, let's assume, ah, oh, when was Mad Men set? Because I remember working out how much something cost on there once, and it was like 10 times as much, or like eight times as much. So let's just assume five times as much. So let's say that it was $60,000 today. That didn't quite work out. Italian designer, Giorgio, Giab, 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 was brought in to create the look of the proposed new vehicle. Although he was largely unknown at the time, he would go on to design a fleet of famous supercars, including the Lotus Spirit, great looking car, during a long career which saw him named Car Designer of the Century in 1999. That's an accolade. An ambitious prototype of the DMC 12 was developed in 1976 from largely untested new innovative materials featuring a fiberglass chassis and an engine stuck in the middle which was very much in keeping with the spirit of high-end racing cars however many of the more ambitious elements were ultimately ditched in favor of more traditional design is at this point i'm wondering like how bored must danny be because he's already said like no interest in cars don't understand the danny write me a script about cars coming next week more cars uh, however, many of the more ambitious elements were ultimately ditched in favor of a much more traditional design. The chassis technology was abandoned and the V6 fuel-injected engine was moved to the back of the car, which significantly reduced the handling power. At least, it still looked pretty stylish though, especially with those incredible gullwing doors. Yeah, it would be cool, like, I'd like one of these, and then just swap out the engine with something that isn't a piece of sh**. Um, that would be cool. The final design of the DMC-12 only came in one color, which was plain stainless steel. John DeLorean was keen to save a few dollars where possible and didn't fancy chucking away good money on paint, so every vehicle was finished with brushed stainless steel and left completely unpainted. It looks insanely cool, though. Like, the, the, the stainless steel look, I think, looks epic. Um, it's like a Cybertruck, which... I don't know how I feel about that. In some ways, I'm like, that's pretty cool. And in other ways, I'm like, there's no f***ing way that's getting on the street, is it, Elon? It doesn't even have wing mirrors. Uh, maybe it's different in America where you can just drive whatever the f*** you want, but there are so many laws in Europe. It's like, if you buy a trailer, right? You know the thing that goes behind your car that you attach with a tow bar and it sits at the back? The, the wheels of that thing, you know, they have to have coverings on them. If you have, like, and if you have your wheels sticking out from the car too much, they always have to have a covering, so you get these, like, weird, like, things covering, and there's so many laws, and I'm like, dude, that Tesla thing, if that hits, like, a cyclist, 
they're gonna be turned into like, you know, just a mist of bones. I don't, it just doesn't seem very real. It's gonna, I mean, yes, they'll make a cyber truck, I'm sure, but it'll end up looking like a Prius. Although we, it is Elon Musk, so, you know, prove me wrong. I'd like that, it looked pretty awesome. Investment money had been flooding into DMC from all kinds of unexpected places, including from the pockets of musician and comedian Sammy Davis Jr., the host of The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, and some guy called Roy Clark. The only Roy Clark that I know of is the writer of a very gentle British comedy series called Last of the Summer Wine. Ah, I remember Last of the Summer Wine. I saw this as a kid and I was like, this is, boy, I think my parents might've watched it or some shit like that. Or, you know, back when there were only four channels and you were like, well, I guess I'm just watching whatever's on. It's like the news or Last of the Summer Wine. And I remember it being particularly shite. Uh, in which a trio of mischievous, mischievous pensioners get into comical mishaps around the English countryside and usually end up hurtling down a country lane in a bath on wheels. Yeah, it does sound bad, doesn't it? Um, even like, even the pitch for that is just like, what is this? What is this shit? Amazingly, they got away with doing it every week for about 37 years. Doing what? I'm so lost. Oh, the TV show. Okay, it's desperately specific, Danny. 37 years for that. It really was. They really never finished that f***ing summer wine, did they? However, I think this particular Roy Clark was an American singer and country musician. Who gives a sh talking about cars? Danny's like, oh yeah, I like music, so I'm gonna talk about music for five minutes. <laughs> Eventually, we'll get back to cars. Come on, Danny! The big question now was where exactly on the world's map with John DeLorean's now super vehicle enter production. Original potential venues included Spain, Canada, Ohio, and John's hometown of Detroit. Well, that would make sense. It's like, yeah, where are you gonna uh, produce the car? Spain. You live in Detroit. Like, that's where, if I think of a place that makes cars, well, obviously I think of China, and then I think of Detroit. Which, you know, China is a massive ass country. Detroit is a specific city. <laughs> I'm like, Detroit's not a state, right? No, it is a city. Detroit, Illinois? Chicago? Oh, who cares? Detroit, Illinois sounds right. That sounds correct. Chicago is a city. Chicago, Ohio? <laughs> I don't know. I don't fucking know. Who cares? Uh, it looked as if it was going to be Puerto Rico for a while. And John even had signed a preliminary agreement to build his factory there on the site of a former US Air Force base. Who cares? Then he received a tempting offer from the UK government to make his cars in Northern Ireland. What's going on? The British government were happy to stump up around $120 million uh, of startup costs if DMC agreed to build their 550,000 square foot plant on a cow pasture in Dunmurray, just outside of Belfast. It would actually be situated slap bang in the middle of the ongoing conflicts between Northern Ireland's Catholic and Protestant communities, which was rather lamely described as the troubles. It's like a f***ing understatement of the century. It'd be like 9-11, yeah, plain whoopsie doodle. Ah, uh, too soon? This name makes it sound as if a few naughty kids were regularly nicking apples from a grumpy old man's orchard rather than an irregular low-level war which would claim the lives of more than 3,500 people, mostly civilians, in attacks and bombings. Oh, sh the UK government's hope was that there was a massive influx of healthy new jobs on both sides of the war, about 2,000 of them, and it would reduce tensions and sectarian violence. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea, government. But it has to be said that the final setup was built with caution very much in mind. The plant had two separate doors for the entry of employees, one for the Protestants and one for the Catholics. And the religion is fucking dumb! You are so dumb. You are really dumb. For real. <laughs> Smash that dislike button. Someone the other day was like, Simon, I don't like, did I already mention this? Don't like taking piss out religion. I like, just don't watch Business Place. You know, just don't. It's okay. I don't care. People are like, oh, Simon, if we unsubscribe, it matters to you. No, no. If you unsubscribe, it doesn't matter. I don't care. I know it's an unpopular opinion, but I'm going to do what the f I want and the people who like it will like it. If you don't like it, f*** off. Channeling my inner Michael O'Leary. Okay, where the f*** was I? And the plant was purposefully built as an assemblage, large, play blagio, of many different buildings rather than one giant factory, so that if it got bombed bits in an attack, some of the buildings might survive, and production of fancy new cars wouldn't completely grind to a halt, because that's the priority. It's like, oh yeah, well, building B got blown up, 400 people died, but the good news is, we've still got, you know, we'll still be making cars. <laughs> the optics of that, not brilliant, are they? 
DNC UK government, whoever the f*** was doing all this. A pressing problem was that most of the new staff just didn't have any experience at all in making cars. This was one of the key factors that led to endless quality control issues, massive delays, and big budget overruns. The first of the long delayed vehicles eventually began to roll off the production line in 1981, although by this time the name DMC-12 had been dropped when the company realized that the price tag would never would be over twice as much as they'd originally hoped. Ah, DMC-12, like $12,000. Genius! Oh no, we'll have to rename it. What a shame, because DMC-12 was f***ing catchy. The newly christened DMC DeLorean, more commonly known as just the DeLorean, named after, I mean, you can see, like, the guy who na <laughs> names the car after himself is obviously the same guy uh, who gave his girlfriend a gift of a leather-bound book with his own headshots in it. It's weird. It would go on sale for $25,000 or about 70 grand in today's money. Oh, I was well off with my previous guess because I said like 12,000 would be 60,000. So it'd actually be more like 35, which is, that's not bad. That's not bad. Like that Tesla, that Model 3 for 35 grand, I feel is quite a good deal. That's quite a car. It has to be said that a reception to the new DeLorean was less than overwhelming. The first wave of cars were still plagued with technical issues, which eventually got ironed out in later models when the staff of the factory in Belfast started to figure out what they all were meant to be doing. Uh, but the critics were still far from impressed. It was generally felt that whilst the DeLorean looked amazing, its performance was very disappointing. The car was equipped with relatively feeble horsepower. It was like 100 and something, wasn't it? Uh, in comparison to, say, Chevrolet's Corvette, which was about 10 grand cheaper to buy at the time. This is one thing about American cars. Like, the American, like, sports cars, you know, I guess, like, the Chevrolet Corvette is one of these with all the swoopy lines and stuff. They are very cheap for what they are. Like, you look at an equivalent, like, McLaren or something, and it's like, yeah, it's three times the price. <laughs> I mean, it's, that they're, they're, they're much less cool as he, I mean, I get the appeal, like the muscle car uh, uh, and stuff, but it ain't a Ferrari, is it? <laughs> it was also criticized, smash that dislike button. It was also criticized for its relatively poor handling, which can be largely attributed to the earlier decision to shift, shift the engine to the back of the car. And sales were slow, not helped along by the fact that the US economy had just entered a recession. Oh, bad timing. I have to say that I'm rushing through this business place a little bit because I really needed to get one recorded because we're so behind the times. Uh, with all of behind the times, behind schedule. Uh, but finally, coronavirus lockdown is over as of yesterday. The boiler man is coming to install me a new boiler today and I'm very excited because it's f***ing cold. Actually, it's not so cold because it's like May now, but uh, yeah, I'm still excited. It's still a little chilly. I'm excited to get a new boiler, it must, it must be said. For those of you who are wondering what the f I'm talking about, my boiler stopped working like three f***ing months ago, just as corona started. And yeah, it's been chilly in my office. Blah, 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 blah. DMC estimated that it would need to shift about 10 to 12,000 new vehicles in order to break even, although exact figures were never published. It's reported that less than 6,000 DeLoreans were ever sold, but John DeLorean still felt that the situation could be rescued with a little bit of help. Uh, by the way, I, I would like, uh, I've got, uh, getting a DeLorean is on my life goals. I feel like the, uh, um, Back to the Future movies are some of my favorite films. I would like to own a DeLorean. One of my uh, favorite YouTubers, I watch a lot of car YouTube because I'm like Danny, I find cars interesting. Uh, Hoovy's Garage, he bought like a, a DeLorean. It was, it was insanely cheap because it was like a piece of shit one that no one want. But it is a great looking car and he has a lot of fun with it. But John DeLorean still felt that the situation could be rescued with a little bit of help. He was hoping for some more financial assistance from the UK government, but the bad news here was that the Labour government, which had first signed the deal to build the new factory, had now been booted out of power. And in comes Conservative Prime Minister Maggie Thatcher. And she wasn't so keen on DeLorean cars. All she cared about was <laughs> scoop ice cream. OG Business Place legend joke there. If you're wondering what I'm talking about, well, you haven't watched enough past Business Place, so I'd recommend you go back and watch them all. Click on all of the adverts as well, because Simon likes his money. DMC proposed a restructuring of the company, which would take it public, but the problem with this plan is that it would have personally enriched John DeLorean while leaving other invest investors, such as the UK government, with crumbs. John DeLorean's like, yeah, do it, <laughs> government money. Thatcher wasn't having any of that. She immediately cut off all future investment to the company, placing the Northern Ireland factory into receivership. A furious John DeLorean later claimed that Thatcher only closed down the Belfast plant because she believed that Catholic employees were tithing or contributing 10% of their wages towards the organization, the Irish Republican Army. I have no idea, no comment. Uh, things were about to get even worse for John DeLorean though. In 1982, he was sat down in a Los Angeles hotel with a guy called James Hoffman and a very big suitcase of cocaine. Here we go. Uh, or at least something 
that looked a lot like cocaine. John DeLorean was unaware that this shady encounter was being filmed by the FBI. James Hoffman, a cre previously convicted drug smuggler himself, alleged that DeLorean had approached him with the idea of bankrolling a cocaine smuggling operation to help provide DM DMC with a handy injection of cash. It's like, look, John, if your business is only going to work by you doing some massively illegal activity, it's not going to work. Just let it go. It's okay. Ah, but narcissism shall prevail. Hoffman had bought the su had Hoffman had brought the su suitcase to show DeLorean the quality of the goods, supposedly about 27 kilograms or 6.5 million dollars worth. But well, I only need a little to sample it. A jolly Don John DeLorean was captured on camera saying that the white stuff was better than gold, and the videotaped conversation turned to the possibility of organizing a bigger 24 million dollar deal. In fact, the stuff in the suitcase was fake, as the whole thing had been carefully orchestrated by the FBI to ensnare DeLorean. Is that legal? I thought that's like entrapment. Tis indeed a trap. <laughs> uh, he was immediately arrested for drug trafficking and would face trial two years later. Just a week after his arrest, G DMC filed for bankruptcy and the Belfast plant closed its separate doors for good. The Ohio-based company, Big Lots, acquired what was left and ended up completing and selling the last 100 remaining DeLorean vehicles. I believe there's a company that sells like modern refurbished DeLoreans, like they take the original or like original ones that were never completed or the parts and stuff and they actually assemble them. I think they're really expensive because you know they're actually doing a good job and they're not shit now. Um, God, I'd love one of those, but I think they're like 100 grand or something. It's pretty pricey. So, and also for 100 grand, I think there are cars that I'd rather get before I bought a DeLorean. <laughs> oh, so things weren't looking particularly peachy for John DeLorean in the mid-1980s. On the plus side, the Back to the Future films were just about to transform the vehicle into a cinematic legend. But on the downside, this was during a period where John DeLorean's car and his entire career were now very much considered things of the past. Yeah, you also could be going to prison for a long time, dude. Like, I know that, like, you can go... I feel like in America I've brought this up a bunch, like, because it's always like, yeah, uh, they, they stole some investment of money and now they're in prison for like 78 years <laughs> oh, shit. and i know that it's like yeah yeah they we, they found like one joint on me and now i'm in prison for life without parole it's like dude if you're smuggling like 24 kilograms of cocaine or whatever i'm gonna bet it's not gonna be a great time his vehicle would be hitting the silver screen in genius works of fiction against the painfully real backdrop of failure a bankrupt company and drug trafficking charges and just to rub salt in the wounds we can throw another 15 federal charges of racketeering fraud and tax evasion into the pretty lousy decade he was having oh john it's not gonna go well it's alleged that around 17 million dollars of investor money had been rather absently absent-mindedly mislaid a Swiss company called General Product Development had been set up to engineer the original DMC-12 vehicle, and this company had been responsible for subcontracting Lotus to lend their expertise to the development. I'm already lost. But while this $17 million flowed from DMC to General Product Management none of, uh, Development, none of it seemed to end up in the coffers of Lotus. Or it seems... Or at least that's what Lotus co-founder and chairman Colin Chapman originally claimed. It was later alleged that John DeLorean had actually conspired with Chapman to secretly funnel this money away for personal purposes. John, this isn't going to do well for you. I, I have a feeling he didn't go to prison. And I'm now wondering how he possibly avoided it. Because every other person on Business Place who's gone to prison, I feel has been way less than this. So take note, lawyers. Or maybe he is it's still in prison. I don't know. We'll find out. But that wasn't going to be possible. Uh, later, a judge would declare that if Colin Chapman had stood before him in the dock, he would have faced a sentence of at least 10 years. But that wasn't going to be possible. Very shortly after the missing funds were first called into question, Colin Chapman died of a heart attack. Dun dun dun! And John DeLorean did it! No, he didn't. Allegedly, not really. I'm just making that up. It's comedic effect. Wait, did he do it? I don't think so. However, things were soon going to take a more positive turn for John DeLorean. In fact, he must have picked up an almighty dollop of the luck of the Irish during his time in Belfast because despite facing up to 87 years in jail, I told you, if he found guilty of all charges, he was somehow acquitted of everything! It's incredible! How?! This FBI sting was declared illegal by the jury, I thought so, when it was revealed that the former drug dealer turned informant James Hoffman, Hoffman had originally pursued DeLorean with uh, a supposedly legitimate, uh, supposedly legitimate deal. Yeah, don't entrap people, FBI. It's not cool. DeLorean claims, yeah, it's like you can't make people into criminals and then arrest them for being a criminal. It's just not ethically on, is it? DeLorean claims that. Wait, I've got an FBI cap somewhere. Someone sent me an FBI cap. I should be wearing that right now, but I'm not going to do it because I'm in a rush. Miraculously, he was acquitted of all fr fraud charges too, even though it remains quite unclear where the mis missing millions went. 
The estate of Colin Chapman agreed to pay £4.67 million to the UK government, while the financial director of Lotus, Fred Bushell, was fined £4.5 million and sentenced to three years in prison. Wait, the guy who didn't even get any of the money? <laughs> But John DeLorean was cleared of any wrongdoing for reasons that may never be entirely understood. Even his own liar remarked that he was lucky to be acquitted. John, you legend. Ins I mean, you dick. But like, wow. So you did none of this stuff. Everything's allegedly, which I see why Danny is like, never said he did any of this stuff. Wow. That does, that's incredible. Whoever his lawyer is, I hope he's bloody rich. That doesn't necessarily mean that John DeLorean drove off happily into the sunset. He would continue to fight legal battles throughout the 1990s and was eventually declared bankrupt in 1999. He was forced to sell his 500-acre estate in New Jersey, which was snapped up by Donald Trump. Of course it was. <laughs> And now goes under the Trump National Golf Club. I can't believe that's actually real. If you pay a visit, check out the steaks and bottled water. OG, there's a lots of sprinkled OG business blaze jokes into this one. I hope you appreciate them and new people, f you. Go back and watch all my other videos. I hope people know that I am joking with that and I do appreciate you discovering this channel and watching because it's how I make a living. Thank you. Um, when asked if he had any plans to resurrect his automotive career, John DeLorean once quipped, Would you buy a used car from me? No, John. I wouldn't. Although, I would like a DeLorean, so I guess yes. Uh, the DeLorean car might make a comeback, though. The brand is now owned, owned by the Texas-based DeLorean Motor Company, uh, who have no connection to the original company, but apparently plan to push ahead with new DeLorean vehicles in 2021. Sounds a bit unlikely. I mean, there's new regulations and stuff. You can't build cars that are just like old cars. Although I have seen electric versions of the Jaguar E-Type, but they're like half a million or something. I, I wouldn't trust myself with one of those. I'd definitely crash it. Although it's worth noting, I, I wouldn't. I would probably wouldn't crash it. I'd just be parking it and I'd ding it really badly, and they'd be like, yeah, it's 80 grand to, not, to, to fix that ding. <laughs> Why? Uh, although it's worth noting that they've been making similar promises for years. By the time they get around to doing it, we may well be living in a road in a world with no roads. Uh, John DeLorean spent his final years flogging very pricey watches over the internet under the banner of DeLorean Time in the hopes that he might raise enough to get back into automobile production. I thought you just said no one likes your automobiles. In fact, if you bought one of his fancy timepieces for three and a half thousand dollars, what? That DeLorean, time, you're not Rolex, you know. Uh, you were awarded with a priority place on the waiting list for new planned vehicles. The certificate bundled with the watch was personally signed by John DeLorean himself and promised that your priority place was significant because overwhelming response is anticipated. Alas, it never happened, and John DeLorean died from complications following a stroke in 2005. Yeah, he was old. Uh, his son, Zachary DeLorean had very mixed feelings about his father's supercar, which is perhaps understandable considering the bold original vision, the watered-down version that eventually hit the market, the iconic status on the silver screen, and the legal battles and scandals that followed the demise of the company in the dream. On the one hand, I feel proud of my father, says Zachary. On the other hand, I just want to blow the f***ing thing up. No one cares, Zachary. You're just the son of the guy. You didn't do anything. Why, why do we care? I don't care. Bonus fact! The DeLorean car may now mostly be remembered for being a time-traveling vehicle in the Back to the Future films, but this nearly didn't happen at all. The original idea for Doc Brown's... Oh, it was a fridge, wasn't it? Time-traveling machine was literally just a simple laser device. Oh, I thought it was going to be a fridge or something. Was that just an urban legend? But this was rejected on the grounds that it was an incredibly dull idea. Also, how do you travel in a laser? The second draft of the script, it was decided that the machine would be a fridge, hey! But then, the producers decided this might encourage youngsters to climb and cry inside refrigerators, so this idea was scrapped too. If you climb inside a refrigerator and get stuck, will you suffocate? Does air come into a refrigerator? I guess so, because they got to bring, like, cool air in, right? After finally deciding to go with a car, the producers chose the DeLorean because it already looked quite similar to futuristic spaceship with those cool gullwing doors. But this decision was only made after the film's co-creator Bob Gale had rejected a proposal from Ford to use one of their Mustangs, even though Ford were offering a tempting $75,000 as part of the deal. Oh boy, Ford, you should have wrapped up that offer to, I mean, hindsight 2020. That would be worth millions, tens, if not hundreds of millions, because think of the fact that DeLoreans are still desirable today, even though there are so few of them, just because of the cult status. Can you imagine? Like, yeah, no. Bob Gale rudely snubbed the offer, reportedly, and reportedly told Ford that Doc Brown doesn't drive a f***ing Mustang. <laughs> what a legend. <laughs> uh, it's not clear what brands of time-traveling fridge Doc Brown would have had in his kitchen. But a boom boom tsh that was a good use of paper. Um, this has been Business Blaze. Thank you very much for watching. We managed to squeeze this in before the boiler man arrives. Any second, I'm just waiting for the boo-doo of my doorbell. But 
Again, thank you for watching. Smash that like button or dislike button. I feel like I said lots of shit in this video that you might dislike. So do that. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Oh, and if people are wondering, like, Simon, why don't you just record when the boiler man is here? And that is because I don't want him to think that I'm fucking crazy. Thank you for watching. Tis indeed a trap. <laughs>